Welcome to the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies, where there's always another secret. We're back. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies. Today we are recording episode 36. Tonight is July 22nd, 2019. And in this episode, we are back on Roshar for a long stretch. We are starting our discussion of Oathbringer, and we're going to be here for a grand total of six episodes. And let's face it, probably a lot more when once we start branching out into our What If episodes. Indeed. It's almost like it's his magnum opus. (laughs) Uh, I am Bill, and I am joined, as always, by my Oathbound co-hosts, Amy and Jordan. Welcome, guys. Hello. Hi. Uh, How have y'all been? I don't like children today, but, you know, that's normal. I don't like UPS all weekend. (laughs) And today's episode is titled, I Don't Like Children. Amy. <laughs> With caveats. Caveats there, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> the asterisks don't anyway. work well in the title. No, I uh, For those of you who listen to the podcast recordings or watch the videos on YouTube after the fact, we want to remind you, we record this live. With a peanut gallery and everything for people to mm-hmm. chatter on about the things we're saying. Throw out ideas that we might end up even making it into the discussion. So if you want to join in on that, come to www.twitch.tv slash innkeepers table. We record the, our episodes every other Monday night starting at 7.30 p.m. Pacific time, 10.30 p.m. Eastern. Come join us. Take part. Throw peanuts. <laughs> that, that's what happens. That's how it works. Yeah. Now, of as course. L- <laughs> now, um, the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies is made possible by the support of our listeners and patrons. The show will, of course, continue to be free. But if you want to help us out, head over to patreon.com slash Cosmere Studies. Even throwing a couple dollars per episode really helps us out as we work to improve the show. Our patrons do get immediate access to our Discord channel where you can talk about the show and the Cosmere with other listeners. It's a great community with a lot of great discussions, and you'll also get early access to bonus episodes, exclusive access to other bonus content, and even automatic entry into some of our giveaways. Now, you know, all that said, we ready to dive in? Let's talk about Oathbringer. Oathbringer! Guys, Mm. when the word tome was coined, (laughs) this is the book they were talking about. (laughs) This is, what is Jordan? That that's You're a song. His, you guys were holding up your books. I don't. <laughs> I, I listened to the audio book, and it, I just it, it's so much I smaller in comparison. You know, I didn't I, say I didn't say phone. I said tome. Oh, gosh. I did. I did a lot of audio and on my phone reading this time, but I still have my physical copy, and it's more impressive than just my phone. So, so it's interesting on Reddit with this last week. I think somebody was mentioning that. They had a, uh, what's it called? They had a, a long flight coming up and there's like, so I'm thinking of downloading Oathbringer to listen to. And I was like, how long of a flight? Oh, about 10 hours. Guys, Oathbringer is a 55 hour audio book. <laughs> yep. I, you will I, get through I, book one, maybe. I remember, I, said, I remember when it came out, I was, I was doing my data entry job and I've been listening to a few episodes of things of Brandon's and I download this and I see that amount and I'm just like this could take a while I mean think about that 55 hours if you listen to this book for two days straight you still wouldn't be finished nope and I I actually had to download it twice because the first time it it didn't download right on my phone oh and like it had like the pages in between each of the chapters where it's like a it looks like looks like a piece of paper on there uh-huh. It wouldn't down those those pages, and so when it hit the audio book there, it would play the audio, but would never show the picture, and so I wasn't sure if I was missing stuff, and so it was yeah, it was a pain. 
Huh, the second time worked, so that was weird. Interesting. It's a big book. Big. Yeah, big it, big book. Um, it's 1,300 pages long, guys. Mm-hmm. That's longer than some dictionaries I have. <laughs> <laughs> and significantly more entertaining, I might add. Yes, yes. Well, I mean, it's a good dictionary. But... It can only get you so far, though. I, okay, I'm a nerd, all right? Leave me alone. Don't <laughs> I hassle I have a kanji me. dictionary that makes you feel any better. <laughs> okay, so this book, because it's so long, and it, it doesn't quite fit the same pattern as the oh. previous Stormlight books that we've done. No, not that pattern. Oh, sorry. Mm. <laughs> no, it doesn't quite follow the same... Structure? Layout. Layout. Structure as the previous... Um, Stormlight books that we've done. And so instead of following Kaladin's story and then following Shallan's story and then following Dalinar's story, there's a lot more overlap because they've all gathered together in your theory. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot more of them interacting. Well, I mean, I guess them. Kaladin took off before the end of the last book, but, you know, yeah, know. there's a lot more going on in a centralized location. Mm-hmm. Think of uh, Deep Space Nine rather than Next Generation. Next Generation mm-hmm. is a lot more episodic because they're traveling from place to place to place. Oh, to place. that's true, yeah. And Deep Space Nine, it's all in a central location. It's a central anyway, station. you know, because that's what our listeners are here to talk about <laughs> in Star Trek. <laughs> but because, because of that and because the book is so long, what we're going to do is we're just going to split it up the way that Brandon has. He's divided it into five parts. Part one, part two, part three, part four, part five. And, the, and so we're going to do an episode on each of those parts. And then we're also going to do a final episode on the interludes and all the the filling it in bits as we've done in the past. So mm-hmm. we will, you know, but that's we were how we're we were going to do some of the, the we are going to epigrams do, we are gonna, with them, right? Yes, we're going to do the epigrams with their respective sections. So yes, because they so, it feels like these ones were all Dalinar's book. It's like his preface yeah. in his book, right? Each each part of the book has its own set of mm. um, okay. set of epigrams. This one was the preface to Oathbringer. Okay. The the in universe book, not the out of universe book. <laughs> Which is gonna get all sorts of confusing. Oh yes. So and I just realized that I haven't pulled up the those epigrams, so I'm gonna go start looking. But while I'm doing that, why don't y'all get us started on exactly where we are? They've, they're, we're, we've arrived at Eurythiru, and they're starting to look around. So, you know, let's talk a little bit about Eurythiru, what it's like and that kind of it's thing. It's super, super tall. And it's wrong. Yeah, everybody's... Uh, Sean especially thinks that it's wrong. Like, whenever she tries to draw it, like, the pictures just don't work out right. And she even has one point where she looks through and realizes that she did like 20 drawings and she doesn't remember doing a lot of them. And they're all just like twisting and surrealism is what she calls it when somebody asks her about it. So Mm -hmm. I was, I was thinking about how she and Renar and both, they have a discussion right before their, uh, their conflict with the midnight mother where Mm -hmm. they're discussing how wrong it feels. Dalinar doesn't talk about it. And Mm Shalom points that out. I don't remember Kaladin saying anything about it. And I don't remember Seth saying anything about it when he visited it in book well, two. I, I wonder if it has to do with the fact that they both share the surge of illumination. That's sort of what I was thinking. I also had the thought that Dalinar doesn't have the illumination or the artistic aspect of it. And Kaladin isn't in your theory for very long. And then he comes back after the Midnight Mother's been dealt with. Yep. So he oh, isn't right. there for as long with it. But Seth, it's clear that he's come there a couple of times. Several times. In but did the, he go inside very much? Yeah, he was in. He was in because they talk about the glass being facing the wrong way in his his okay. chapter. I it guess was, I'd it, forgotten that it was an interlude in book two. Was that one of his interludes? I thought that was Shalon mentioning that. No, no, he uh, in his interlude he mentioned that, and that was the first hint to your Ur- 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 Okay. Um, I do remember that, but I didn't remember him being inside it for some reason. I yeah, just, he, for no, some reason, thought that he was in, outside. In the interlude, he was on top of it. No, so I just I thought it was interesting that because this is you know upon my third reading, I noticed that she mentions that you know Dalinar isn't sensing it, but her and Renarin do. I just thought mm-hmm. that was sort of interesting, and 
it's clear there's some there's some connection between illumination and the midnight mother of some kind something creative is going on well and like well truth uh, watchers i wonder what what are their well there's there's the uh there's the there's a theory that that the midnight mother was actually bound by a light weaver yeah, oh. which is, it's not. I don't think that's a theory. Shalon says that straight okay, up. Well, she, she, could, she said it was could, attacked by a, a light weaver before. Okay, I couldn't remember if that was something that I read in discussion on Reddit or if that was part of the book because I'm, it's part of the book that together. she says it was attacked. It was trapped here by a light weaver before. Okay, yeah, and that light so weaver did what they were doing more than Shalon did. Right. And so well, I, mean, I don't know. Shal- I just I thought it was an interesting thing, but the reason I I find it interesting is there's one other person who comments on the wrongness it's Marais, right yeah hmm. uh, and he he's oh that's her, right because he, he sends her to secure to go the deal with it he's like you got to deal with the wrongness but mm-hmm. i don't know is it's not clear if it's him that senses it or just people that he works with or he knows other people who are he also has a it. chicken on his shoulder and brandon it's, has confirmed it's an yes. avr <gasps> yes when was that? No one told me. It's a it's a word it's a word of Brandon. That, oh that my is goodness. an AVR. <laughs> if you have, and for those of you who haven't, uh, maybe you've read this, but you haven't read like Arcanum Unbounded, the AVR we covered them in uh, Six of the Dusk. That's where those come from. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I. It's a very short read. Highly recommend checking it out. Yes. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. It just it got me thinking. That if you have an AVR, it does something. And yeah, well, do we know which kind he had? Wait, we don't know. Brandon hasn't said. My I just gut- thought she said it was. I thought she said it was green. Beyond that, I don't know. Well, we don't know if the colors are exactly. Yeah, what I guess tell that's us true. anything. But my my gut tells me he, what it might be is something akin to a bronze misting. Mm. It's just so you know a seeker. Yeah. I don't. I don't have any evidence behind this. Just sort of, that seems like something Mraze would be interested in. Hmm. Yeah, and that might be helping him sense the wrongness. That's just my gut. It's a. It's yeah. a. It's a tinfoil hat theory. <laughs> but uh, it's just sorry. That was a aside that I had literally two days ago, when I was re-listening to that scene. No, oh, that's interesting. I hadn't. I hadn't realized that. Hmm. Anyway, so yes, they're but, in your Ethereum. And yeah, so they're looking around and it's wrong. And it's really easy to get lost. And there's a lot of levels they haven't even gone up in. And they're mm-hmm. also running out of stormlight because I it's do, the weeping. I do find it interesting that Shalon finds it a lot easier to navigate than anyone else because she's able to recognize the strata mm-hmm. from being a light weaver. And so. Well, and just I think even just being an artist, too, well, that she's I, looking for those details as well. Brandon has said that a lot of those things like her eidetic memory and that kind of stuff comes from the, oh, is that the from? that's part of the uh oh the resonance that mm-hmm. light weavers have. Um and you you actually notice cuz again we we've talked about how based on word of Brandon Tian was also developing that's right light with his... abilities and he had the the stones all the stones that he would put get him wet and stuff like that yeah. Yeah. So oh one heads up also even though we are discussing part one today, all spoilers for this book are open. So for our listeners, just to be aware, we if you have only finished part one, there there may be spoilers for you. So you, you'll want to be careful about what you're listening to today. Just We're to not a, re, a read-along podcast. We're a re-read-along podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something like that. Mm-hmm. No, it's yeah, I, I found it. It's interesting. The way he describes it, it's the first time I can really recognize Brandon truly writing something that almost feels Lovecraftian in how he uh, describes Urethiru and they're not being able to quite get everything down with it, that there's just something off about it and they're not sure what Uh huh. Mm. it's. It's very different. The only other time I can remember him sort of describing something in that sort of unknowable way is in secret history when uh Kelsier looks at ruin right yeah he just sees this roiling undulating <laughs> massive thing creepy 
And then yeah. we see the Midnight Mother and the Lovecraft just gets turned up to 11. Oh, yeah. The, the unmade are Ooh, very, the very... She starts Ooh. talking about faces boiling to the surface. Just and like, I'm like, let's oh. just read that fast. I'm glad oh. I have my headphones in so my kids aren't hearing this because they'd be like, what's that, Mom? <laughs> uh, let's not talk about what's that. It's Ray Shafir, the Midnight Mother. You don't want to meet her. Mm-mm. If you guys keep uh. acting like you're going to act, uh, <laughs> you might get visited by her. Yeah. I don't need those nightmares. No. So one of the things that that <laughs> everybody was wondering at the end of Words of Radiance was, okay, so uh, Adolin just snuck, stuck a knife in a guy's eye. What's the fallout from that going to be? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Adolin murdered someone. <laughs> and so Brandon and doesn't... And then chucked the, so- the, the shard blade out the window. <laughs> yep. Dude. So so Brandon doesn't shy away from that. He, he just jumps right in where Dalinar is looking around and then suddenly somebody comes up and says, so somebody murdered High Lord Sadius um, or High Prince Sadius. And uh, yeah. of course, and everybody Dalinar, thinks goes, him. Dalinar goes to check it out and the Colin guards and the Sadius guards are having at it. Yeah, and they're so. ready to, to duke it out. Or is, is it Bridge Four? Yep. I, think I thought it was what it thought it was Bridge Four. So they've Bridge got even more co- beef are among the Kalen guards. So yes, yeah. absolutely, because they were not treated well mm-hmm. when they not were so part much. of Sadius's camp. Nope. What I thought Sadius was always so good to his bridge crews. <laughs> Such a generous man. Yeah. Y- yes. <laughs> exactly. Right. And so of course I- Dalinar comes in and he says, "All right, well, we're going to figure out what happened. I didn't do this, but I sure as heck want to find out who did." One, yeah. to clear his name. Two, because in spite of their differences, Sadius had been a brother to him at one point. Mm-hmm. And Dalinar kind of wants to know what's going on. You know, this is, they just got here and already people are getting murdered. That's not a good, you know, way to, precedent to start with. Yeah, one, one small side. I, it was only with some of the back, uh, the backstory scenes from Dalinar that you finally I could finally see why Sadius and Dalinar got along because before all you saw was their mm-hmm. current relationship and you're like, you two got along at one point? Why? It's so right. it's nice to see how they did get along in the past. But yeah, anyway. the flashbacks do a lot to give oh. the sort of the background yeah. of Dalinar and Gavilar. And the, you also get to know Gavilar as a character a bit mm-hmm. better. Yeah. Um, I love the flashbacks. And ELA one. as well. Mm-hmm. ELA is also interesting. Um, okay, before we dive into the m- main storyline, which do we want to do first? Because we've got the flashback storyline to follow, and we've got the modern storyline to follow. Wait, I want to talk about just Adolin we... a, a little bit, since he's... Okay, okay. so Dalinar's... let's go with the modern storyline. Yeah, and Dalinar's just like, all right, I need someone I can trust. Adolin, I need you to <laughs> investigate this. And, and in the I background, love... you just... You just hear the tuba. Boom, boom. Da, 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 Oh, what? man. Uh, it's, I love, no, okay, I love man, how, it's like, they, they put it, like, in, I think they have it from Shallan's point of view, and she's looking over at Adel and just is, like, got this look of, goes oh, white, no. Just, just goes and she's there going, oh, no, does, is this, I can't remember what she thinks, is he grossed out, or or is he worried about it, or something like that. She does not come to the conclusion of, he, he did, did it. it. <laughs> Which, why would she? Adolin's a good guy. He wouldn't do things like that, you know, because Sadius mm-hmm. pushed him to the edge and then just like, yeah. The thing is, what I love about it is on one hand, there's Dalinar being like, oh, we can't have this. Not right now. This is a bad time. Everything's chaotic. <laughs> and, you know, you know he, he clearly didn't want him assassinated. At the same mm-hmm. time, everything practical about what's been going on, it was 100% the right thing to do as far as trying to keep everything together, because Sadius is nothing but a fly in the ointment at every single time well, he does well, anything. When, when Adolin killed him, he was talking about how he was going to be a fly in the ointment. He was just saying, was I'm going gonna to be keep a doing fly. this. He was going to be <laughs> like, so this is how more. This is how I'm going to spin things. This is how I'm going to torment Dalinar. This is how I'm going to mess up everything you're trying to do. And that's when Adolin's finally just like, he got to go down. Nope, and, nope, nope, nope. <laughs> it, it, it was a crime of passion. It wasn't logical. This isn't like mm-hmm. Vin at the end of uh, Final Empire where she's like, it was, they need an assassin. This is important. It's Aelin just like, nope, nope, nope. 
I'm so was, done. Just done. It was a little of each, though, because like it was a it was logically justifiable. Yes, it was a crime of passion in the moment, but at the same time, it was just a he's got to die. Like it was because they've lot. given him chance after chance, and he keeps proving that he's not mm-hmm. going to be anything but a problem. And they're like, we can't afford this anymore. And you just shoved at the wrong time, and yeah. But, but the it, thing like, is, it had but, to be but Adolin, Adolin too. But but Adolin wasn't yeah. thinking, "Rara, I want to kill you. You're a jerk." Adolin was thinking, "Sadius needs to be taken out. Sadius mm-hmm. needs to be out of the picture. We will not be able to accomplish anything positive if he's around." And so it wasn't like while it was a crime of passion because the passion was there, there was a cold logic to it. Oh yeah, mm. it, it's 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 one so. of those things. It's interesting from a from a, a morals point of view. Whether or not mm. was it a was it an honorable thing to do? And Adolin struggling with that the entire book, and right. I think he comes to the conclusion: no, it wasn't honorable. But who cares? It was necessary. <laughs> yeah, kind of already done. It, yeah. it was basically: I will accept those stains on my hands. Yeah, because and it, this needed to be done, yeah, and but and no one else really other than him could have done it because Kaladin certainly can't do it. Yeah, he mm-hmm. he's the one who protects lives. Dalinar can't do it because he's the one who's supposed to unite people. Shalon couldn't do it because she's just not going to be the one to do something like that. That's not her. She already, she already has enough issues going on. She doesn't yeah. need to be the you, you say she's the, you say she's not going to be the one to do that. She's the one who's done that kind of thing three but, times oh, now. All, all well, was her- I saw somebody did a thing and they had like a little a little graph and it showed like these characters would would not attack you. These people would would protect you. And then it's like would they they would draw a knife as a threat and then. All, all these different levels. I'll have to find it and put that up, a, a screenshot yeah. of it. But, but I think I love that. Yeah, it was fun. Every Shalon. time Shalon has killed someone, it's because she's cornered and put in a Shalon. bad oh, yeah. situation. Shalon is Ender scary, like Ender's game, Ender. Mm. Because it's like, I need to end this permanently. Well, and she, <laughs> she actually references that when she attacks the Midnight Mother. She says she didn't, like, this wasn't uh, the practice, you know, of Brightness Radiant. This was the the scared girl, you know, who was mm-hmm. who was defending her father, her is her, her father from her mother, and no, who, herself who, from who her had mother. been herself, and, yeah. yeah, herself from her mother, and when cornered by, uh, oh, who is that thief lady in the second? Tin, tin, and co- you know, trapped by tin or whatever. And mm-hmm. I just she talks about how it's this is when she was cornered, and you know, mm-hmm. and it's there's something, uh, and obviously I go to Smash Brothers real quick. There's some, like, you don't have anything to fear from a practiced person who, you know, is slightly worse than you. But someone who's unskilled at fighting, but who goes all out on offense, sometimes can really throw you off your game. You're just not prepared for it. And I just like to think that's how Shalon <laughs> attacks. Just She's just like, as soon as you flip the switch, it's just she attacks you with everything she's got. She doesn't hold mm-hmm. anything mm-hmm. back. Right. And I love that. It's kind of awesome. What's the whole, uh, she doesn't start a lot of fights, but she ends them. Oh, yeah. She's decisively like, nope, we're done now. But yeah. It's just. Okay. Because usually, because I a... think, anyway, sorry. I had a thought, but it does not really matter. What is it? So it was, I think a lot of why she gets the jump on so many people is because you don't expect it. Whereas right. if with Kaladin or Dalinar you would, or Adolin, you would expect They've got a big sword or a big spear or whatever, whereas Shallan has her safe hand covered. She's a lady. She's probably smaller than them. They're not going to expect that she's going to pull out this giant shard blade. Well, she is so just... prim, proper, mm-hmm. and if shy the way she is. And, like, what is, I think she doesn't use the word demure or in... Oh, but what was it? She had Dem- a phrase. Demure or, is definitely... Yes, but she, she there was a, a phrase or there was a sentence that she said where she was... I think she was talking about being radiant and how she... She was pulling in traits for Radiant about how she hated being called I thought words was right. like that. I thought I it, was it was Maybe not. But it was, it was anyway. like, anyway. So, so it was Diverting. something like that. Diverting. Diverting. That's what it was. Uh, yeah. Um, yes. Yes. Clever. Clever and diverting. Clever and diverting. She's like, that I was, hate that's... that. So. Yep. Okay, so wonderful scene that, I, that I'm excited to talk about. The wedding. <laughs> Brandon loves taking tropes and turning them on their head 
And this one, the royal wedding, he absolutely has done that. <laughs> um, because essentially there are n- no ardents who are willing to marry him to Navani because in Voran faith, that's incest in their minds because she is the widow of his brother, which means that she is his sister, which mm-hmm. means, ooh, ick. To say I mean, nothing of his other heresies on top of it. <laughs> right. <laughs> But but at mm. least, you know, they might have been willing to marry him in spite of those if the marriage itself wasn't such heres- so, so heretical. Um, and so he says, you know what? The Stormfather is a piece of the Almighty. Who better? <laughs> and it's just, it's such a cool scene. You know, mm. they all meet on top of your Ethiru. And just the descriptions of how the Stormfather arrives and they're all just like, and suddenly there was a presence. Mm-hmm. And they just sort of know, like they've just, because he's such a powerful presence that, oh, he's there. No announcement, just suddenly, oh, something's different. Mm-hmm. And he starts talking. And it's such a simple ceremony. Because what is, yeah. what is the Stormfather all about? Oaths. oaths and that's what a, that's what a wedding is mm-hmm. it's two people making an oath to each other and they basically say you know i am hers and she says i am his and he accepts the words and it's done yeah i, I mean also- he, he does i think he adds the phrase like will you've broken oaths before when he's talking to navani and she's like mm-hmm. yeah well humans are frail like that but i'm gonna keep this one Yep. And it's like, all right. I just also just love how sort of he's just sort of like, OK, <laughs> he doesn't care that much. But like, and well, then once he's, he's done his O's, he's done. He leaves. Yeah, he just just K.A.T. I'm out of here. <laughs> and just everyone's like, which well, is that happened, which okay. is interesting, though, because when Dalinar is swearing himself to Navani, he's already bonded the Stormfather himself, which means the Stormfather is essentially going to have to share him. And so it's just it's interesting that he just takes that in stride so much. Well, I imagine like, other radiants were married in the past. Right, but but, but, but I mean, so the storm father would have seen that there were other married. Right, that's, but he's also like that. Now that he's you also say, very untrusting of humans and oaths and. Well, yes, yes. But that's the thing. He doesn't quite care about the human itself. He cares about the oath. It's not the mm-hmm. human. He doesn't mm-hmm. care about. On the other hand, you then compare that to the other discussion of spren and marriage with with Kaladin and Sill. With Kaladin realizing Sill's probably going to be there <laughs> on whenever he consummates a relationship, and he starts imagining. Oh, crap. She'd probably yell, shout words of encouragement. Encouragement? That's not going to help. The and, best part, oh, I accidentally yeah. stumbled upon a thread on the Reddit where they started thinking about what she might uh, say. It's horrible oh, and no. wonderful and Jordan, hilarious. Jordan, this is a family podcast. It is. PG. PG. <laughs> but people can search and it's hilarious. <laughs> oh, gosh. And we all know Pattern is going to be re- the exact same. Oh, no, Pattern's of. the opposite way. He's he's totally just b- blocking the whole thing. No, well, lady. only once he's to- all only when he's been told that's his job, yes. and so he's like, oh, oh, that's my job. I love when he's he figures out that that's what they're referring to, and he starts blurting it out. <laughs> well, and then at one point, like they're exercising, and something happens, and he's sort of distracted, and he like mumbles it sleepily. He's just sort of like. No mating, you know. <laughs> it's just like beavers and ducks, beavers and ducks. <laughs> He's yeah. uh, just him realizing. Oh, I'm I am to stop you from, from copulating. <laughs> I think is what he said. <laughs> He's he some very copy. very very uh, medical term or something. And Shalon's just like. Yep. <sighs> He he. But the thing is, he takes his role as as uh, what's it called? Um, chaperone. 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 Very very seriously and happily. Yep. And I love how Shalana's thought is like, wait, I don't know if he counts as a very good chaperone because he trusts everything I say. Yeah. <laughs> it's like okay, you don't have to chaperone any- anymore. Okay. Okay, we're good. Uh, it's like 
turning off parental con- like if, if a kid knows the password to your parental controls mm-hmm. is there really any use to having them <laughs> mm-hmm. nope. uh, <sighs> now one thing that was interesting is this is also the very first time that Dalinar really tells anybody that he can't hear his wife's his, y- his dead wife's name yeah, it's he so, doesn't remember he, her face. He remembers nothing about her. He cannot even hear her name. It's all shh. It's just so like so completely removed from him. And it, it's it's kind of cute ish how it comes out is because Navani's like, well, I I know I don't want to replace her. You know, I I know you still love her, and he's like, no, you gotta you gotta understand. I don't even remember her. Like she's gone. She's it's like she's a blank gone. space in there. Yeah. Uh, he, he lost all the pointer variables. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Meanwhile, after the wedding's taken place, our uh, our traveling bridge boy has has come home. He goes home. I love this. It's so he funny. Used this, her <laughs> this Jordan, we're not wowing. <laughs> I mean, you say that, but he used his hearthstone. So he did hearth to mm. hearthstone. Mm. Uh, so Kaladin finally returns home. Just so many wonderful things happen when he gets there. He gets to punch him too. Well, like, well, f- first off, first <laughs> off, he gets there and he's approached by a guard, who is just just a regular townsperson. You know, mm-hmm. he has no training as a soldier, but he's just. They realize that they need to protect themselves because everything just went crazy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the Parshman woke up, busted out of the wa- out through the wall. I think. And yeah. took off. And so everything has been just sort of thrown into chaos. And so they're doing and, the best they can to protect. And the crazy storm has come going the wrong direction, mm-hmm. too. Exactly. And so they figure out that they need to protect each other. Kaladin shows up in this ragged uniform. You know, for, you know he went through the... Because isn't he wearing the same uniform that he had when he um, fought He's- Zeth? I think, I think so. he may have. He, yeah, he may not have changed it. You know, so, I mean, like, he's probably looking a little bit the worse for wear. So they think and, he's a, a deserter. And so they think he's a deserter. <laughs> well, it's not like he has brands that, oh, wait. Oh, and he yeah. Has, and he has these two, these slave brands as well. Va- and, violent slave brands, you know. Uh-huh. Yeah, the, the, the Shash brand, dangerous. <laughs> dangerous. Just the and, setup. What did you do, boy? Did you punch <laughs> some light eyes? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's the least that I did. All I could, all I could think of is just the line from the Dark Knight, and it's like, let let her go, and Joker just, you really should have used better words. <laughs> oh, but, you know, so they bring him in, and I love how his parents' immediate response is to protect him. Mm-hmm. Because they see the boy who went off to war. And, you know, and they think he's back. He's uh, disgraced. He's a deserter. We need to protect him. And they have absolutely no idea what he has become. Oh, yeah. And it's it's funny. He even makes a comment to himself. He's sitting there eating some soup that his mom made. And he's like, wow, I turned into a kid again. It's like, I can't do this. Which is what it's like. You go home oh, yeah. and it just feels so bizarre. I mean, like, you know, I'm 37 years old now. I go home. And suddenly my mom starts mothering me again. And it, you kind of slip into it, but it also feels weird. And mm-hmm. so it, there, it just feels off because it's just like, I'm not the little boy who, you know, you had to drive to to elementary school. And, you know, mm-hmm. it's even weirder when you you bring your kids with you and mm-hmm. then. You sit there and I part of me is like, oh, I'll let my parents take care of my kids for a few days because mm-hmm. I'm tired of dealing with it and I want to relax. But then I find myself bopping back and forth between I need to be mom and mm-hmm. I want to be the daughter right now. I don't want to have to right. be mom. But like from his perspective, he looks around and everything that seems so important and life altering seems very, very small. Even the goblet of uh, spheres mm-hmm. that, He's like that's nothing that money-wise. just triggered everything between his father and Rashon. it's a pittance it's mm-hmm. just it's spending change to him now and it's just absolutely fascinating see, you know seeing him come back with this completely new perspective because he's been out he's seen the world he's flown 
like under his own power. Mm-hmm. He's the captain of the guard. He's won He's the... three different shard blades. <laughs> One of them an honor blade. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's true. Plus, one of them that's still alive. Yeah. You know, he's also got a sill blade. Yeah. But it's interesting that he goes in, he, he's just like, you know, sill, he doesn't summon, summon sill, he just goes in, sort of to scout things out and see how everything's going. And it's interesting because everyone is making wrong assumptions here. Well, mm-hmm. there was also the thing, uh, I think we covered it a little bit in the Aluminum Foil Hat episode, where Sill's talking about how she, like, this is how they she remembers mm-hmm. it. Yes. And Kaladin's just like, you weren't here yet. No. Mm-hmm. But the winds were. And it's, I'm of the winds. So I know. And I don't know. And then she talks about, plus there was a distant voice, one of... Uh, one of your crystal one. tinkling Pure crystal or something like that, yeah. which we have, we, you know, we assume it's something to do with cultivation maybe, but anyone's guess is as good as another, but mm-hmm. right. But again, you know, people like people are making wrong assumptions. His parents think he's a deserter who's come back and, um, Rashon thinks the same thing. Kaladin thinks that, uh, oh, what's her name? Is it Yerl or Laurel? The, the Laurel, Laurel. Laurel. Yeah, the, the the girl that he, you know, was, she's married to Rashon, and he thinks that she's oppressed and wants to be rescued, and you know he mm-hmm. try, and and so he comes in, sort of, guns blazing, and she's just like, "Why are you destroying my home?" And she gives him that that just cold stare that stops him in his tracks, because he did have his nice little moment to show off, because he summons Syl. And stabs as a, as a blade and like, stabs her into the ground. My <laughs> and it's very dramatic, and everybody's kind of blown away because, you know, he's a shard bearer, which automatically makes him of the third dawn. On top dawn, of that, none. we've we've already we've already set, pointed out Kaladin is a total drama queen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he as if he knows any other way but to bluster in like a storm. And mm-hmm. just upset everything. He he doesn't know subtlety. It's not his strength. But I I love that. I think it's Rashon looks at him. And he's like, "How did you get it?" You know, thinking you stole it. And he's just like, and his response is, "Does it matter?" <laughs> because <laughs> it's it. it's the having <laughs> that grants him the authority in in their mm-hmm. culture, and because it's a weapon of mass destruction, essentially. Yeah. But it's just interesting seeing all of the different relations and expectations that everyone has, and everyone is wrong. Um, and, and then, of course, the conversation he has with Laurel, he's like, contact Navani Khalid. She's just like, do what now? <laughs> and you know, finally, she's like, fine, I'll humor you. And then and- it goes through. <laughs> And then imme- it goes through an immediate, it's, it's uh, you know, Captain Kaladin, this is Dalinar, how are things, wh- what? <laughs> okay, we're and what this. happened while you were gone? <laughs> and like the expression on her face, because her eyes sort of get wide and she sort of looks at him with an eyebrow raised. And he's, and this is, you can tell she's rattled, but she's still holding her composure at the same time. Mm-hmm. But yeah, everything is different and nobody knows what's going on. And it's just interesting seeing everybody's response to him. Kaladin starts talking to them as a commander, just putting the right authority into his voice. And the soldiers start obeying because it just sort of feels natural. (laughs) Yeah. It only gets him so far though. He isn't able to do quite as much. He has to do a little more past that, but for a little bit, he gets them to just by having Uh the right stance and voice, they just do it anyway. Mm -hmm. Well, it's because they're trained to recognize authority. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. And, and then Kaladin of course has trained to have it. And then of course he exercises some another kind of authority by opening up his pouch of spheres. And he's like, I'm gonna trade these two for one if you give me give me infused spheres. And they're just like, wait, what? And then he <laughs> starts to fly. <laughs> no, you actually missed, not. You but skipped we, his we, brother. We, we, skip, we skipped an important part. Because yes. the first time he meets Oridin, that mm-hmm. is one of the most touching scenes that Brandon has written. Because it's, you think about 
what his parents would have gone through hearing first that Tien was gone and then that Kaladin I mean they, probably they were, is they were told he was he told, died. they were told that he was killed mm-hmm. and you know they just think we have to move on which had to be the hardest thing they did oh yeah and then this little boy comes into their life and starts to heal them and it would have been a long time after because I mean he's mm-hmm. only like one mm-hmm and but well, I mean, and Kaladin's only been gone for a few years. Like I think it's just like oh. three three years or so. I guess that's true. But well, the point is, they know, had to start their family over again. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, they had two sons, and then suddenly they have none. Their line was ended. And just the moment when when Kaladin looks at Oridin and realizes who this child is, because at first he just sees his mother holding a baby and she's thinking, Oh, you know, mom's helping one of the village women with her kid. And then he recognizes who this has to be. Oh, I think she says too. Right. But j- just the moment where it all come clicks in his head mm-hmm. and he just realizes, Oh my gosh, there's another brother for me to watch over. And, you know, he fully recognizes this kid is never going to replace Tian, but he's a point of healing that's mm-hmm. been absolutely needed. And you can see even in him, he's, he, his brokenness kind of starts to heal from this little boy. Um, and I'm actually really, really excited about, you know, because we've got between books five and six, there's going to be that 10 to 15 year time jump. <gasps> oh, yeah. Which means this little boy is going to be about teenager. You know, a teenager and assuming Brandon just, doesn't rip our hearts out and have him killed before that he had <laughs> better not <sighs> like that I don't think Brandon's that cruel <laughs> no. Brandon has done some 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 harsh things particularly in this book but I don't think he's gonna go mm-hmm. there I, I really the, hope I don't he doesn't. it I wouldn't want, further the plot the right way you don't know That's that what yet. I'm gonna bet I'm gonna hope Hope that it would Ugh. not further the plot because that, I just want, that would just. I, I want that little fear just in there. I just want. Nope. I want everyone it's to just have that little fear. It's always there. I know. I know. It's nope. always there. But I just. Oh, I love it. <laughs> this. Yeah. yeah. Oridin. Just. I, he's a nice little po- part that addition to the story that Brandon did that just really, really. It was. It was a. It was beautifully Ugh. written. It was gorgeously written. Mm. And then shortly after that, uh, Kaladin. Um, he surge binds in front of them for the first time. He sucks in stormlight, starts to glow, and then le- levitates off the ground just a little bit in the doorway. Yeah, right before he goes, and then and you see everybody looking at him, and there are people looking with fear and horror and awe and wonder. And then he sees his mother's face, and she has just this look of pure joy when she's looking on her son, radiant. You know, the son that she thought was dead. Mm-hmm. Radiant lifted off the ground, and she just thinks he's not just back; he's glorious. And it's just it, the emotion in, on his mother's face just really just, uh, got me right in, right in the feels, and I loved it. it just yeah, it made me really happy. And then he takes off and goes and finds the the parchment. But he he has to jump a few towns before he does it. And I think partway through, he makes a comment to the fact of some of the people start to look a little disappointed when he doesn't do two for one anymore. (laughs) And he's like, if I did that, I couldn't. I I would be way out of money really fast. I wouldn't have enough stormlight. But nobody says anything, but he can tell in their faces that they're like, oh, the exchange rate dropped. Yep. Okay, so I, I meanwhile, just, I, the, this the, I love when he sees the like they have the money waiting for him, and he's like, "Ah, <laughs> I see why they were so prepared." <laughs> <laughs> yep. Now, meanwhile, back at Irithiru, Shalon's having her whole crisis going on, oh, and man. Pattern, poor Pattern, he's just like, "I understand why you hate me." You're just like, "Oh, Pattern, Pattern. nobody hates you. We all love you. You're wonderful. Love you're you, you you're make so us cute. laugh." <laughs> But it's just, and she says, I don't hate you, I hate the sword. And it mm-hmm. really confuses him. Cause and he's like, oh, he another is the sword, lie. And, he's, and he's, he's, he can't understand it. It's, mm-hmm. And she even it makes may- a comment, she's like, I don't understand it either, but she doesn't mm-hmm. tell him that. 
It, ma- it makes sense to her because she segments everything off in her mind already. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Pattern and sees Pattern tends to see things as a whole. And at this point, particularly, this is sort of where her personality is really starting to splinter into yeah. those three, um, into Vale and Radiant. Because, you know, a- Adolin comes in and starts chatting with her and says, hey, you're a Radiant. You have a shard blade. I need to teach you how to use this. <laughs> He's all excited about it. He's uh-huh. like, I got to teach her how to use the sword. This After seeing that <laughs> sweet, sexy safe hand. <laughs> I loved that scene so much. That was an awesome scene uh, where she thinks it's Polona and it's Adolin. And she's like, what are you doing? You can't come in. And he's like, well, he's you like, invited me in. You invited me <laughs> in. It was a feminine. It was okay. And she's You're... like, it was a feminine knock. <laughs> Did you knock with both hands? <laughs> <laughs> Twitch, I'm just imagining like anyone going up to a door. Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> you have to knock with both hands. He's like, I'm holding the platter. What do you want me to do? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Uh, and so places. that, and so they decide that they're going to start searching together to, to find the murderer. Wait, well, Adolin mentions, and she decides she's going to she help. D- him. I was like, wait, he's she not decides all, on her own. He's not all that keen on it because, well, he didn't want anybody to find out who actually killed Sadius. Mm-hmm. And he keeps pushing for the, I think there's two murderers, <laughs> but I don't know why there's two murderers. <laughs> oh, man. I just yeah. have a hunch. I think just there's a two hunch. murderers. I just, I just, yeah, I don't know. I just think that <laughs> he—he's not very good at this hiding thing because he really should just be like, Aww. no, clearly, yeah, copycat, mm. same guy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Ooh, but he's, yeah, yeah. yeah. Adolin is kind of Adolin is kind of intentionally obtuse when it comes to the inves- investigation. Just like, oh look. Down there, there's a clue. Where? He looks it up. And <laughs> <laughs> he's terrible at this. Uh, he's really not yeah. good at this. Yeah, I don't, It's like Adolin shouldn't have... Uh, Adolin's aspirations is for high prints of information are probably, you know, never going to happen. So, Yeah. Well, well, and of, so they... Who's well, going to go? Well, I was just going to say, now speaking of Adolin, <laughs> I love... How much, they, they start to explore his relationship with Renarin a lot in this. Mm-hmm. Um, I just, and it's, which is, it's, it's really cool because, you know, Adolin has been sort of the golden boy, the, the athletic one, the, you know, the, the captain of the football team, the, mm-hmm. you know, and Renarin is second string in the band. Like they don't even let him march. Oh, you know? <laughs> poor Renarin. I can say that I was in marching band, okay? So, <laughs> but it's just like, but you see their relationship really develop in, in both in the modern storyline and in Dalinar's flashbacks. You just sort of see that connection and the just the fact that they're brothers. Mm-hmm. The conversation between Adolin and Renarin when Renarin heals Adolin's wrist, mm-hmm. you know, and, and Renarin's just sort of like, you know, I'm. You know, they're all radiant. And, and Adolin's is like, you're a radiant too. That's kind of you awesome. Are. And and then his ha- his hand is healed. It's just like, Renarin, you're here to save us. You know? <laughs> I don't know. It's just a little bit of healing, you know. No, it's just no big you deal. It's like, no. Like it, but I think it's pretty cool. <laughs> okay, Jordan, that's way too inside of a joke. <laughs> <laughs> that's a joke literally for only Bill, but it makes me happy. <laughs> uh, he's referencing a friend of ours. Anyway, but just I am really excited to get to book six where we actually get Renar in flashbacks. Oh man! Because I think that's how long we're going to have to wait to actually figure out what's going need, on with Renar. Because we need Eshenai still, and we need who's the other? And uh, Seth. Seth. That's Seth. right. No, book six is supposed to be Renar. Okay. And I'm really. But looking he's changed forward the to orders because... before, so. But yeah, right, for, but for now, this is what it is. Th- this one feels more solid. Like I'm not saying it's permanent. It's always open to change until the book is published. And I'm just so, I'm really interested to. So the other the other relationship that we get to see that we hadn't seen before is Adolin with the uh, obviously with the Shalon, but sort of as the more political side of their relationship because they are both royals. Mm-hmm. And so they have to handle these things. So like when they go to speak to ELA. Oh, that's right. Like, that's what I was going to mention was that. 
I, right. I, I found it very interesting because that's the part of their relationship that they, they've got chemistry on a personal level, but now they've got to work out the, the logistics of, oh, yeah, we also have to rule things. Mm-hmm. And they have to figure that out. They, they do a fairly decent job, but I, I love Adolin, you know, hi, I'm walking into the den of the guy who I murdered. And the Viper's she, den. Yeah. Because... And, yeah. And somebody just descri- like, Meh. somebody described ELA like they were trying to find a visual comparison, and the one they came up with was Morticia Adams, and I think that's perfect because she's just she's a viper. She's I don't I don't think she is as pretty though. No, no, not not quite. She's re- she's de- she's described as a handsome she's, woman, and so it's so like, like she's strong she's, features and kind of different things. Well, and mm-hmm. they in the flashbacks, I think. Dalinar makes note that like she wears a lot more makeup than everyone else and mm. mm-hmm. like she's she's clearly trying to cover up that she's not as pretty. The other mm-hmm. thing that's interesting, she doesn't strike me as clever in this one as she was in the previous book. And right. I think it's because is what Adolin and Shalon are trying to work out, she just lost. Her and Sadius mm-hmm. were a well oiled machine, and she just lost the other half of that machine. Well, she's and besides trying that, to play she's, both roles. And she's mm-hmm. grieving, too. Well, yeah. and yes, she is. And and mm-hmm. that's also one of the reasons that she so quickly elevates Amaram to be High Lord Sadius. Because she knows because she's, she's not she, functioning on all cylinders, so she's like, I can't I can't yeah. do this, so he's gotta do it. Well, mm-hmm. and she's being way petty throughout the entire yes. book. Oh man. Yeah, understandably so. Oh no, it's one of these things it's fine. Like it, it's perfectly understandable. But it's one of these things that it's just like, for me, reading it, I'm like, she's not firing all cylinders yet. Yeah. I'm going to be interested to see what happens after after all this in books four and five. Because now, mm-hmm. you know, after the events of everything, now she's truly backed into a corner. And she's mm-hmm. going to be a little more desperate. And yep. with her connections, I have a feeling she's going to do something in book four that's going to shake things up. Well, I mean, Mraze mm-hmm. describes them as, you know, she and Sadius were too much of a wild card to be invited into the Ghost Bloods and because their motivations were their own. And mm-hmm. because, you know, she has that desperation and she has that thought of self-preservation and self-advancement, she's going to be very dangerous. Ugh. She's going to be scary. I was I was expecting her to be a lot more bigger of a player in this book when I read it. Um, but she's she's definitely not down and out. So, oh god! Just love that line by Ada Lynn. It's just like my aunt Navani always told me how clever you are. So this is really kind of disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just sort of like, yeah. ooh, Ada getting sassy. <laughs> now, speaking of royals and ruling and that kind of thing, the confrontation confrontation slash meeting between Dalinar and Elokar where Elokar mm. essentially tries to abdicate, and Dalinar's just like, don't be an idiot, you're not abdicating. Um, I love so that finally line, he... though. Why won't they listen to me? Oh, I don't know. Maybe they think you might usurp their kingdom. <laughs> <laughs> and then like, hmm. Well, and, and then he's just like, you know, Dalinar, am I your king? Yes. He's like, fine. And he kneels down, and he basically just says, I swear everything to Dal-. And Dalinar's just like, whoa, whoa, get up, get up. God, people are going to see you, whoa. You know? <laughs> and suddenly Dalinar is, he's like, you know, we have princes and high princes. Why not kings and high kings? And he basically just says, he swears fealty to Dalinar. And it really kind of rocks Dalinar's life. Because suddenly, for this to work, he says, okay, he'll have to give up all his lands to his, to his heir, which is Adolin. Mm-hmm. Which means that Adolin is now High Prince Kalin. And his, he, you know, he is no longer Alethi. His land is Urethiru, mm-hmm. which is dying. You know, like, they, they, they can't get everything up and working. There's no, it's not sustainable just yet. And so he, suddenly, he's the king of a desperate land. Yeah. But, you know, Dalinar went in a desperate situation. That's kind of when he gets scary. So, mm-hmm. but yeah, it's, it's, it's just the political how, how quickly, is interesting. how quickly the politics just shifted 
at that point. It was absolutely fascinating. Well, it's such a great growth moment for Elicar because mm-hmm. it shows he's final. He is finally thinking about what's mm-hmm. good for the kingdom as opposed to how do I live up to my father's legacy. Right. Well, and uh, Brandon has said again. This is a spoiler for the end of the book, but Elicar, you know, he was about to swear. You know, he swear the first ideal, and Brandon said that his first truth that he spoke because he was going to become a light weaver. Brandon has said that the first truth that he would have spoken was that he was a bad king. Mm-hmm. And just, you know, and so the fact that Elicar was starting to come to grips with that, because that's sort of what the truths are is an admission and coming to grips with these lies that you're telling yourself. Mm-hmm. And so Elicar was going to have to admit I was a bad king. Yeah. And this is that's that same scene where he starts making up the idea to go and try and get back. Yes, um, he wants to. But what's the Colinar. city's name? Colinar. Colinar. Yeah. So he he starts making that idea, and I think in book two is mm-hmm. where they they actually start doing more with it because Kaladin's back. Right. But yeah, in this Kaladin, one, that's that's most mean, of what you see Elkar doing. Uh, book two uh, of Oath part Partner. part two, part two because they're called yeah. books, aren't they? No, they're parts. <sighs> The, bo- the books are books, because it's book one of the Storm and Light Archive, book two okay. of the Storm and Light Archive. So, yes, part two. Mm-hmm. But, it's, yeah. It's uh, it's one of those things that's like, oh, that's disappointing. <laughs> yeah. I know. Hmm. Oh, boy. So, again, Amaram is named as New Lord Sadius. And it's th- there's an interesting conversation between him and Dalinar where he calls Dalinar a hypocrite. Because, you know, Dalinar waged a campaign of blood, wading through mm-hmm. bodies to, to get there. And he's like, you know, sure, now that you've got what you want, it's easy to stand on your high horse and, and tr- create this ideal. His literal but high horse. <laughs> we're not talking about his Rashadia. <laughs> but, so uh, but yeah, it's just very interesting because that comment hypocrite rings in Dalinar's mind a few things over the course of a few times over the course of the book. Mm-hmm. And so I just found that a, to be an interesting. Well, and it's, it's very interesting now that we're getting to see him in those early days where Dalinar is not this, uh, you know, this stately man of, mm-hmm. of high ideals. He's a brute. Yeah. He, Ooh, yeah. Well, I mean, he, the scene where, they're having the dinner when he first lays eyes on Evie and he is drunk out of his mind to the point where he starts wandering around, trying to find a knife steps out into the high storm, like strolls you know, across, to go strolls get his across knife. the courtyard to get his knife comes back. You know, he's soaked and everything's just been tossed around and he just goes over, he sits down and he starts cutting his meat and everybody just sort of stares at him <laughs> as he walks from the open gate with the storm blowing outside and walks and just plunks himself down. And they're just like, did you have a nice walk? You know? <laughs> <laughs> and what is, I think, like, um, like I needed Evie's a brother is, I can't remember what his name is. It's something I can't the, either. It's like Tav. Yeah, well, tav oh, no, the, the Evie's Evie's brother. brother. Evie's brother. Yeah. Evie. Anyway, um, Evie. Anyway, but, like, he, he, like, walks away to go do something else. And I think Gavilar says something effective. His people don't usually go wandering in high storms. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's, that's not normally. Could be Toe. Well, and that's at maybe. the same time, he's... Yeah, Toe. Toe, thank you. And at the same Never time, mind. he's also trying to decide, you know, is, is this the guy who can protect us from our enemies? We're on mm-hmm. the run. And, just look. and and he just takes a walk in a high storm and it's like, yeah, yeah, he can take care of well, us. Oh, and then, and then to add on to that, there's the assa- attempted assassination on Gavilar that... <laughs> Yeah, and he uh-huh. takes, care of. takes the guy's knife, kills him with it, wipes the blood off, starts cutting his meat. <laughs> That's as right. As nothing. That's right. And he's just like, I needed a good knife. And everyone oh, else is just Jordan like, just freeze? holy he crap. Did. And there's Dalinar. We lost like, Jordan. Do, 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 just eat meat. <laughs> it's like, I needed a knife. <laughs> It's like that's where and I'm like that's where his knife went. He got stolen by the assassin. Yeah. Oh, he was just so drunk out of his mind, and it was. Just, but he was still a very functional drunk. The fact that I mean, it was, yeah, like Brandon's writing for that scene was really, really well done because you get an, a hint of what's going on, 
but it feels just slightly surreal because we're getting it from Dalinar's perspective. Mm -hmm. And because we're not drunk out of our minds, hopefully, while we're reading, because there's just so much. I wouldn't want to read this drunk. I would just... I want to savor every word. But, you know, we get that, okay, there's something off here. But Dalinar, it's just like, I, I needed a knife, and he had well, one. And he's so. like, and these, these feasts are really boring anyway, so I, it's yeah. just weird anyway. Well, and I well, love me, seeing his existential crisis Jordan of Frozen he again. has been yeah. a weapon his entire life. And suddenly the campaign is moving away from the war part into the politics mm-hmm. part, and he's just like, I'm yeah. I'm a useless appendage at this point. What do I do? Yeah. Yep. Now, later on in Dalinar's flashbacks, he does have to come to grips with cuz that sort of changes cuz when they re- when they go to uh the rift? No, it, th- this was this wasn't the attack on the rift. This was the uh when they conquered the final high princedom. Um, oh, and he's what in was the... his name? Oh. Yeah, what's his name? K- Kadash. Kal- Kalinor. No, Kadash oh, was sorry. his Got Kadash it. was his general, um, who became the Arden. No, he was he was fighting Kalinor. <laughs> um, first off, the fact that Kalinor climbs up to the top of this stone pillar because he's like <laughs> he can beat me in a fair fight, so I'm going to introduce as much randomness as possible. Mm-hmm. That's smart. As yeah. someone like, who plays Smash Brothers with items on, I respect this man's. Uh, as as someone who plays a lot of board games, there you know, I'm not the kind of person who sits and strategizes and plans seven, eight moves in the future, and so I like a little bit of extra randomness thrown in because it gives me a fighting chance against like Dylan and my, my what you know one of my buddies who is is a str- strategist. Shout out to Dylan; he listens to the show. But you know, I like a little bit of randomness because it gives me a little bit more of a fighting chance in it. And so th- th- I'm just like, this is a like smart move. So he climbs to the top of this pillar. So there's, you know, they're in close quarters, any wrong step and they could fall off and just, you know, it's all. Yeah. Um, it's it, it, the so, other thing that's really good about that is it just shows how even though it's a desperate situation, the Alethi mm-hmm. way shows that you just you fight till the very end. Hmm. Jordan keeps freezing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Fortunately, for our podcast listeners, you're not going to have any issues because we have his recording. But I don't have no idea what you just said, Jordan. <laughs> yeah. Well, this will be fine. Okay. <laughs> um, but the thing is, uh, you know, Dalinar. You know, a- after the fight, Dalinar knocks him off, and you know he's dead on the ground, and his shards are there, and his soldiers go around trying to recover the shards. And suddenly mm-hmm. Dalinar gets hit by the thrill, jumps down, and just and murders slaughters. all of them. Mm-hmm. Um, Including some of the, his oh, own guys. Actually, let me, let me step is back Is that the same bit. fight or is it a different fight? It's the same fight. Okay. Oh, no, the, 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 some of his own guys, that, that was earlier in the fight. He, he did it in that one as well. Oh, okay. Because Kadash okay. talks about it. Okay, but, but the thing is... Um, Sorry, I, I do want to take a step back. When he's fighting uh, Kalinor, it's interesting because he sees the thrill in Kalinor's eyes as well. Mm-hmm. And he and doesn't he, like it. And you see this sort of feeling of betrayal. He's like, that is a very intimate feeling. That it, you know, How dare he see that in one of his opponent's eyes? Mm-hmm. But the thrill, you know, doesn't, is just... Do it. It, it doesn't care who you are so long as you're murdering. Well, and it's it, what's interesting about that whole exchange is it's then reflected very interestingly when Shalon uh, confronts the Midnight Mother. She talks about mm-hmm. how it knows like it knows her intimately and mm-hmm. she she knows it. And it reflects how Dalinar's talking about the thrill and how it's his and they know mm-hmm. each other. And then it's well, foreshadowing, you know, the climax of the book. Speaking of that, like, I mean, you think about it when Shalon faces the Midnight Mother, she places her her safe hand. Yeah, her bare her safe un, hand. Her bare safe hand on it. Like that, you know, in, in Voran society, that's one of the most intimate gestures you can make. It's a big and, deal. And it's just, you know, it's like this absolute closeness. Before, and that's what she has to do to chase it off. Mm hmm. It's an absolutely fascinating. But but what I was saying is, after um, 
sorry, did you have something to? Oh no, I was just no. It was just it was it was one of these things that I never caught that on the first, even the second read through. But the third time, uh-huh. I'm like, oh, I'm starting to see the foreshadowing that's going on here. Uh huh. And so Dalinar, you know, after he's murdered all these people, Gavilar comes up to congratulate him, and Dalinar turns and he just sees everything that Gavilar has that he doesn't and he's ready to kill him and take it he's seeing red literally but, like yeah um fortunately for him his uh, helmet is down and so Gavilar doesn't see the look in his eyes you know because he's ready to kill him and then suddenly he's just stops he's like whoa no no this is not okay that's my and brother so he, and so he makes an oath to himself he says I will never be king I can never be king because you know, it, it basically just to prevent himself from coming even this close. He says, this is not a, a line I'm willing to cross. King, the kingship is just not for me. I can't trust myself as king. And I, if I'm having these feelings, I don't deserve to be king. It's never, it, this is his. And he essentially, the same way that Elikarth swears fealty to Dalinar, Dalinar in his mind swears absolute fealty to Gavilar at that point. Mm-hmm. And it's just a really interesting moment for Dalinar there. It, there's and there's one other thing I find interesting about that because he gives uh, he gives him the, the the shards, gives them to Gavilar for his heir, mm-hmm. and right. it's just like yet for- another thing that Elokar didn't get to win himself that Dalinar got for him. Yeah, mm. that's and true. Just just everything in Elokar's life is just handed to him in such a way that just reminds him. No, no, Dalinar got that for you. Nope, it's all mm-hmm. Dalinar and your father. Mm-hmm. Okay, we're get, we're getting close to running out of time, but there is one thing I really, really want to talk about: the girl who looked up, because it's Hoyd, and I just anything that involves Hoyd, I absolutely love, and I think this is some of the best writing for Hoyd that Brandon has done. Wait, I thought um, the anytime, Hoyd part wasn't till later. There's he's he's in. The- there's a chapter called "The Girl Who Looked Up." Yeah, but is it, that are we later? sure it's Hoyt, or are we sure, or are we thinking it's Sh- or Roche am I mixed? I think the, you're thinking. In. There's two. The there's, story gets told twice. The first time okay. she, in this part one, she you're tells right. it to Pattern because right, someone runs right. away, and I think it's Reshapir who yep. runs away because that's when what? she starts to. It's it's the Midnight Mother, right? Who's watching? Yeah, because yeah, that's that's the first time she oh, notices that's right. the that's first right. time. Okay, that's right. I, I'm I'm sorry. I was laying I was laying out the outline and I saw the chapter. The girl who looked up. You're right. It's told a second time. So it's yeah. This isn't Hoyd. It will be, and <laughs> that is wonderful. But it's an interesting story because she's you telling know, it to pattern. But just the story is really, you know, it's an interesting concept. She starts because, putting on the ultimate one act play. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Or one and, person play. You know, just about this girl who she lives in a community and there's always been a wall. And she asks what's beyond the wall and everybody says, don't go over there. There's a wall. There's bad things on the other side of the wall. And she climbs the wall and eventually and looks over and she sees stairs leading up. Which means that if there are stairs on the other side, then the wall is meant to keep something out which of is that side. on her side. And just it's a fascinating concept of, wait, we're the monsters. Which we're what they're afraid of. We're shadows. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it, it's just such a cool double story. And that th- that's the other thing is she tells the story and then Hoyt tells the story. Mm-hmm. And Hoyt's got a very, very different perspective on it. And it's just it's really interesting seeing him shift because you know she remembers that that part of the story and she thinks i'm a monster because that's what shalon has grown up thinking her entire life is i'm a monster i killed my mother i killed my father Mon- the what was the line in the second book monsters don't deserve to be held yeah i guess something like that and she says it and at the time we think oh she thinks her father's a monster and then she's we realized later herself. on, oh, she was talking about herself. She thinks she's the month. And it just breaks your heart again. Mm-hmm. And so. The, th- the other yeah. thing that's interesting about just her doing this is, A, it's her experimenting with her light weaving, which is something that we don't get to see as much mm-hmm. uh, of in this book. 
because she's done most of her experimenting in the second book when it comes to her light mm-hmm. weaving. But the other reason right. it's interesting is she's learning that she's doing a lot of things based on instinct. Like, mm-hmm. she she makes a crowd and she's like, whoa, I didn't intend to do that, especially because of how they're trying to conserve Stormlight at that point. <laughs> and here right. she is just using it all up. And then, but, and then, like, when she confronts the Midnight Mother, she's in her... Uh, her veil outfit. Yeah, her veil outfit. And when she's like, oh crap, they can't see me in this outfit, she makes the Hava. And then when mm-hmm. she comes out of the fight, she's still got the Hava on. She's just like, whoa, that's, huh. I didn't drop this. How did I, how did I, kept, I held it the whole time somehow. Right. And so it's, there's a lot of stuff she just does instinctually that she's not quite understanding. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a lot, a lot of that's the artist in her where she does things a lot by instinct because that's just art's a lot of instinct on things. Right. But I just thought it was very interesting to see her starting to, to do little things like that. Mm-hmm. Just evolving a bit more in her abilities and becoming stronger just through familiarity. Even it was also just interesting to see bridge four from her perspective. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Well, and she, you know, when they're fighting the midnight mother, she creates, you know, she recreates images of all of them. Um, which it's an interesting combat because that's also what the Midnight Mother does is she creates these Doubles. deformed images and she creates real ones from and that's the other thing is she realizes her collection that's been destroyed she's pulling images from those from that from even the destroyed pictures that she's done mm-hmm. before and so suddenly she realizes I can reach farther back my abilities are growing mm-hmm and then, of course, a little bit later on, Kaladin comes back to Irithiru after his little adventure with the Parsman, which I don't think we're going to be able to talk about tonight. We're, we're but it was it was really fun to read yes. all that and see his discoveries and his see his growth. If, and mm-hmm. the, if there's anything, well, this this book deals a lot with its perspective because you're getting well, Shalon's perspective on things. It's different, and Kaladin's getting perspective and it, how it complicates things. Well, especially because you all again see a parallel later on in the book. You see his experience with the the Parshman and Moash's experience with the same Parshman, even. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I thought because you know, because the they're just consistently running parallel and like Kaladin and Moash are foils for each other in in these books, and it's so it's just very interesting to see how it affects each of them and how they respond to that. When Kaladin just, um, still does think Moash is his friend, though, because I think he says that was for my friend Moash when he punches the... When he punches Rashon. Yeah, that's because yeah. Kaladin's a sentimental fool. Aww. Well, that's also before Moash does some other, other stuff. Other things, yeah. yeah. But no, it's, um, just, it's, it's just... With his oath of, I gotta protect everyone, him mm-hmm. getting perspective just complicates things so horribly for him. Mm-hmm. Well, and a lot of people, there's a lot of speculation about what the fourth oath is going to be for Kaladin. A lot of people are positing that it might be, um, I will protect those who I can and I will forgive myself for those who can't or something like that. Um, which actually kind of ties back into the very first book. Remember the scene where his father is have, has to choose between saving Rashon or saving Oh, yeah, son. Doing, doing triage there, yeah. Yeah, the, and, and so, and that's kind of... I think one of the things that Kaladin has trouble with because he wants to protect everyone and mm-hmm. allowing himself to not protect everyone is all, is like, that's even worse for him than, than protecting people he doesn't like. Yeah. And it's, it's so, you know, he, it's just very interesting watching his journey and watching and Syl it, struggle through it with him. Mm hmm. As a creature of instinct, who's just like... Well, the, the conversation he has with her about the definition of honor, you know, is like, is honor doing the right thing or just doing what you think the right thing is? Yeah. And, you know, and she, she doesn't know. And it's just really interesting seeing them kind of trying to figure this whole thing out together. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, of course, we end the, the section of the book... With with Yasna Kalin arriving at Eurythero and because you can't just, kill Batman, nope. and it's just, but I I just love like 
you know, there was there was this huge group of people, and at their head was Yesto Kolid, and it's just, and end of part one just kicks open Boom. the door. Boom, yeah. baby, <laughs> I'm back. Uh, and of Don't course, we know that Yasta is still alive. <laughs> None of them did, and suddenly she's back. Mm-hmm. And Shalon's just like, "Oh!" Mm. And Shalon has no idea what to do with herself. But that—that's all part two. Yeah. So we'll do that later. Uh, just guys, can't kill something that awesome. This book is so good. <laughs> <laughs> I'd forgotten how much happens in it. And then I'm like, oh, yeah, it's a big book. A lot happens. When you have 1,300 pages to do stuff, things it's, happen. <laughs> a lot happens. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think the only really big thing we didn't cover was that um, Dalinar finds out the Stormfather can bring other people into the visions. Oh, yeah. Yes, and that's going to be so Which means things much fun. are going to be so fun in the next part. Guys, Queen Finn is one of my favorite characters. <laughs> I love Queen Finn. <laughs> She's awesome. Just she's so blunt and just no nonsense. She's just like, stop giving me the flowery talk and talk straight. And they're like, uh oh, uh oh. Is this? And he's like, that's fine, that's fun. <laughs> that's what she yeah. does. <laughs> it's like if if she's talking more formally to you, then you know you're in trouble because yep. she doesn't trust you. I forget. Yeah. Does Taravangian come in this one? In yes. Part yes. One? yes he shows up also too. Shows up. He's, he showed and up. Down, it's down so harsh. Like, Dalinar's just like, oh, I don't have to face it alone. At least I have Taravangian by my side. At least my good buddy Taravangian, who it's will just, never oh, backstab me. He'll be standing right next to you with a knife to your back. And, of course, he comes with Malata, who is a dustbringer, who both both Sill and Pattern seem to be wary about the dustbringers. So. Yeah. Sill hasn't met her yet, though. Right. Yeah. But it's just sort of a... They don't like them normally. They're an interesting race. And I'm fairly certain that, you know, because we've been getting a flashback perspective for each of the orders. I'm fairly certain that Ash is going to become a, a Dustbringer. Mm-hmm. Which is that really Ash. appropriate. Yes. You know, even though she's the patron of the Lightweavers, I think she herself is going to be our Dustbringer flashback character. So I don't understand. It's not like she's destroying things. Oh, wait. Right. <laughs> well, and I just love the concept that when they describe Dustbringers, they like to take things apart to see how they work. My immediate thought of that was Siler from Heroes. Oh. Right? Oh. <laughs> it's a terrifying thought. Oh. Creepy. So, anyway, um, it's time for a giveaway. Yes. Oh. I am, of course, prepared for this. <laughs> yes, you are. The number is 39 is what you're looking for. As a reminder, we're giving away this knit cap that has Kaladin's uh, slave brand as well as the Shash brand on top. The mark that makes him recognizable to everyone as our favorite bridge boy. Honor spread not included. All right. Clicking the button. Okay. So, yeah. The number 19. is 39. 19. 19 is Suave Zombie 215 from Instagram. Hey. <laughs> That's a fun name. <laughs> so we will be reaching out to you via Instagram and let you know so that we can get your information and get that sent off to you. Um, again, a special thanks to the Brandon Sanderson online store at store.brandonsanderson.com. They've, you know, hooked us up with some great goodies to give away to our listeners, and they've got some awesome stuff there, too. You know, they've got... that beanie's not even the coolest thing in there. (laughs) No. (laughs) They've got books. They've got... um, Stickers. Shirts. Jordan's wearing a shirt from them, actually, right now. Not from the actual... We had this before. Bill gave this to me. No, no. From the store, not from the bag. we, We didn't raid the bag. We are upstanding people. (laughs) <laughs> yes, this is something I gave Jordan a couple years ago, I think, now. this For those of you who can't see it, I am wearing the 8-bit, <laughs> uh, very Final Fantasy-style Nightblood talking to Seth saying, would you like to destroy some evil today? <laughs> sure. I made the mistake of wearing this to work one day. And, oh, no. And, no, it, it was my coworker who guesses everything ahead of time because he's horrible and apparently uh-huh. has future vision. And, uh... He's just like, wait, how's Nightblood going to talk to Seth? And I'm like, <laughs> and I'm just like, for the record, he is in book one at this point. Like he, 
because I can't stand this. And I'm like, I'm like, it's uh, Twitch. I'm like, you it's, just it's a, like, I'm it's like, a meme. Well, no, to which I say to him, I'm just like, look, you you see a glowing sword and you immediately think it's night blood. He's like, it's the same thing. And I'm like, it is the same thing. And I'm like, so it'll be interesting for you going forward. And I can tell he's sort of like, hmm. And then he gets through book two. And he's like, you idiot. It was it was definitely a dark blood. I'm like, of course it was, but I can't just let you know that. <laughs> uh, it was bad enough that you could tell something was up with the earring in book two. Yeah. Oh, I'm still mad at him for that. Anyway, Stupid so... That's our giveaway for this week, and you know, make sure to listen in two weeks. We'll announce a new one because we, we just get patrons. to give. We have cool stuff to give away, and we have awesome patrons. So, thank y'all for making this possible. Now, we had our first aluminum foil hat theories episode two weeks ago, and we need to restock our collection of emails from you, our listeners. So please write in, give us your feedback, ask us your questions, let us know what you think of what's going on in the Cosmere, send all of this to CosmereStudies at gmail.com, and we just might read your email as part of the show. Yeah, because Sezet, he uses a uh, copper mine to store his knowledge. Uh, we use an aluminum foil hat mine to store all our <laughs> conspiracy theories. Oh, shoot. You realize that aluminum destroys everything stored. Maybe yeah, that's and why guess what? All the lately. theories are probably <laughs> wrong, so it makes sense. <laughs> oh boy but like the aluminum foil hat they're fun yes hmm. indeed now in the meantime we each do have our own personal projects that we've got going on outside of the podcast jordan where can we find your work uh twitch.tv slash splice stream uh twitter at splice stream instagram the real splice stream um, we are doing uh, the Professional Amiibo League is officially starting up tomorrow or, you know, whatever time related thing is for the audio visual people. But uh, then the other thing is I'm going to not this week, but maybe in a week or two, be starting up a Saturday morning splash stream. I'm going to be streaming XCOM again. Finally can oh, wow. get back into that. And uh, for those of you who don't know, XCOM is the most brutal uh, tactics game that I know of. And... Uh, if you follow me, you have a random chance to become one of my soldiers who will probably die. So, Yeah, just as a heads up, the very first XCOM game that came out, there was a glitch in it that put everyone, no matter what difficulty you set, on easy mode. And nobody realized it because everybody was still dying. It was that <laughs> hard. And We're not playing so like, that one, thankfully. Pe people didn't realize that it was, you know, that it was glitched like this for years. Like, I think it was over 10 years later that they finally realized, hang on a, a second. That's how hard of a, a game this is. So buckle uh, and, up. And I play a mode called Iron Man so that it's impossible to save scum. So there will be tears. Hmm. And the odds yes. of me actually beating the game are low. But it's, it's fun to see how this train wreck gets there. So, you know, tune in. Don't grow attached to your, uh, to your character. Attached. It's a huge mistake. <laughs> All right, What's Nanny, great is what you get us chat. You're just like, no, Swaggy Sun Twenty Seven. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Amy, how about you? Where can we find your stuff? Um, I'm on Facebook at Coincidence Cosplay and Props on Twitter at Coincidence Cosp because my name is too long, and Instagram is Coincidence underscore Cosplay. Um, so I'm doing. I, I styled the wig for Anna from R Ralph Breaks the Internet, and I realized that my part's too far, so I have to fix that. But otherwise, my Anna's done. And then I have to fix up my Eleanor, because it just needs to be fixed, and I haven't done it. And then I have my what's first wrong with the, What's wrong with the Eleanor? So I have two knee-high stockings that are sewn into the wefts, and when I put the, the two big, chunky pigtails behind me, it parts, and you can see the stockings and so you don't want to see that inside her hair so that's what i have to fix and i have to make the dress more fitted to me because it's a little big right now um and i reprinted the crown so it actually goes around my head instead of just sitting on top mm. so i have to redo all of the finishing work on the crown got it and then i'm making a he-man the 80s he-man oh gosh so for, yeah I'm for for who for a friend of mine in okay. heroic so yes cool cool so I'm just no, like, I'm well, not I'm a, not I'm a, not dressing as he that's man. That's a now. that's a daring uh, family <laughs> friendly cosplay there. 
<laughs> no, I'm so I'm making the cape in the little briefs. So that's nice. That's Who wears yes. short shorts? He wears <laughs> short yeah. shorts. Oh gosh. And as for myself, when I'm not here, I've got a bunch of board game reviews over at the Innkeeper's Table at www.innkeeperstable.com. I post about games on social media, so go check those out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at at Innkeeper's Table. For those of you who can't become patrons just yet, consider heading over to iTunes, Spotify, wherever you listen to us, and give us a five-star review. It'll really help us out, help people to find us as well. Um, any final thoughts on part one before we sign off? We'll have to do the more of the flashback stuff later because we didn't. Do, I guess we did cover that. We, mind. we covered we covered most of it. We we, oh. we we went pretty quickly through it, but we. I we liked covered... I liked Thaka, the archer guy. He was fun. That I was loved a that great scene. moment. That's true. Well, so I, just, if I you love reread it. Reread that scene. It's awesome. I I love how very just casual about it. Dalinar is. He goes up. He's like, that was an amazing shot. Shoot, shoot that tree. <laughs> and He's he like, no, 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 dude, just and, do it again. <laughs> and like his guards are basically standing there with their swords to fuck his throat. It's like, He's like, no, shoot the tree. Or no, and it's he, a corpse. And he, he has a shoot a corpse. Oh yeah, shoot the corpse. He's like, that's a good shot. You want to work for me? <laughs> He's just like, I was just trying to kill you. He's like, and now you won't be. You did you a know, great like, job. <laughs> the, the person that you you served is dead. You know, I'll, I'll give you a purpose. Work with me. And it's just like... I, I, and he's just so matter of fact. He's like, okay, you're you're working with me. All right, let's go. And <laughs> just like, fine. Of, you don't want us to loot. We won't loot. That's good. You know, fine. We won't loot this time. And like, that's sort of where <laughs> his elites came from. Is he found all the best soldiers he could, whatever side of the war they're on, mm-hmm. and he just takes them. And he's like, okay, you're on my side. You're you're, you're one of mine. <laughs> and <laughs> it's just sort of so matter of fact that nobody can really say no to him. Mm-hmm. It is at a certain point. It's like he's collecting Pokemon as he goes along the way. <laughs> It's like, ooh, archer type. I don't have one of these. Gotta catch up. That's, that's kind of what it is. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> anyway. Uh, yeah. Anything else, Jordan? Any final thoughts? Um, yeah, I like the Thaka seed. Uh, the, the seed that I really <laughs> liked in this that I, I wish we could just have more of. I love just watching Bridgefort descend down with Shallan. And Lopin mm-hmm. doing things that <laughs> makes everyone else just <laughs> just just ponder maybe throwing him down the chasm like he did Lopin, that diamond lo- ship. L- Lopin Lopening. Yeah, mm-hmm. just the Lopin. It's just like <sighs> you have to. But keep it's just him. like he he throws the diamond ship down, and it's like well, at least we know that's where the bottom is. <laughs> <laughs> I just and then at the end of that whole thing, oh, we might need to pre- pass guards or, or uh, set up guards at Teft. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's guards yes. might be a good idea. And they all look and they're just like, "Oh my goodness, that's a lot of dough." And 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 then we find out that's just the pillar in the middle. And then we find out that all of the drawers are loaded with gemstones as well. <laughs> so just a oh, Scrooge yeah. McDuckian amount of gemstones. Yep. McDuckian. Uh, McDuckian is my remake of Howard the Duck. I don't know. Anyway, in addition to the live episodes of the show that stream on twitch.tv slash Innkeeper's Table every two weeks on Monday nights at 7.30 p.m. Pacific Time, 10.30 p.m. Eastern, our listeners can find our videos on YouTube or audio versions of the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, pretty much anywhere else that you want to look for podcasts by doing a search for Cosmere Studies. You can also follow us and contact us through Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook under the profile at Cosmere Studies. For our next episode, we're continuing our discussion of Oathbringer, moving into part two, and we would love to have you chime in on the discussion in chat. So join us for the live stream here on Twitch in two weeks on August 5th, 2019. In the meantime, though, on behalf of Amy, Jordan, and myself, thanks for listening. And remember, there's there's always always another another secret. secret.